My name is Wayne Lee. Uh, I'm a professor of history and the chair of UNC's Curriculum in Peace, War, and Defense. And uh, I'm really grateful that you are all here. And I'm grateful to the, uh, the Global Center and to Shai Tamari and the Center for Middle East Studies here at Carolina for helping put this on. They've done a lot of logistics. I just did some emailing and got people to the panelists very kindly to agree to come. Let me explain a little bit in sort of obvious terms why we're doing this. Somebody, when we were putting together the propaganda for this event, you know, the bulletins and the posters, had a whole paragraph about why we need to do this and why it was important. And I said, I think it speaks for itself uh, why this is important. But I have a very clear memory when I was a graduate student at the other school just down the road back in the middle 90s of an event just like this at UNC regarding the US intervention in Bosnia or not. It was prior to that intervention. Uh, I have a very clear memory of participating as a panelist in an event parallel to this in 2002 at the University of Louisville where I then taught. And it occurred to me in the middle of last week that we needed to do that here about this. Um, I think the importance is, is clear um, and there is expertise at UNC that's capable of talking about it and I'm gonna introduce them to you in a moment. Thank you very much all again all for coming and I'll ask Sarah to begin. My job today as a historian is to provide context for an ongoing catastrophic war being ra waged right now across Syria. The occasion for this panel was growing speculation that the U.S. would or should engage in military action in response to or in retaliation for a chemical weapons attack last week in a suburb outside Damascus. I'm hearing increasing calls for a military strike. Today, for example, Diane Rehm, usually considered one of NPR's liberals, booked three people on her show at 10 this morning, all of whom argued for such a strike. Their reasons ranged from humanitarian to geostrategic, but all drew the same conclusions. I will argue during my allotted five minutes that historical context screams against such, any such militarized intervention, and I welcome your questions and comments and challenges after everyone else has spoken. The current Syrian regime came to power in 1971, and Hafez al-Assad held the presidency for three decades after that until the year 2000. He came to power as a military leader, and his 30-year rule ended the constant instability that followed Syria's independence in 1946, 25 years in which 18 people had served as president. He aimed to maintain his power through ruthless suppression of dissent. That could dissent continued despite all his efforts. Syrian pro-democracy activity continued under the rule of his son Bashar al-Assad, who became president in 2000 on his father's death. Hopeful that change would be underway, the so-called Damascus Spring of 2000 saw the flourishing of civil society groups demanding democratic and human rights in Syria. The famous Statement of 1000 followed in 2001, calling for an independent judiciary and the end to the single-party state. Four years later, the Damascus Declaration provided the ideological justification for sweeping change in the direction of human and political rights. Many of the leaders of such opposition movements have suffered the prisons and tortures of the regime, and many who have survived are, have been central to the movement for peaceful change in Syria that has been ongoing for decades. It's important to note that these people are not Sunnis opposed to the government. There's Sunnis and Christians and Shiites and Alawites. There's a comprehensive movement for change in Syria that's been ongoing since the Syrian state got its independence. The current crisis in Syria resulted from the frustration of young people and the horror of their parents when the regime cracked down on young graffiti writers in the southern border city of Dara, arresting children, their parents took to the streets in protest. The Syrian government's brutality resulted in escalating outrage that quickly spread across Syria's landscape. Syrians are seeking basic human and democratic rights. The US and the rest of the world have so far intervened only to militarize the conflict that they began in the name of those rights. Arms have poured into Damascus, allowing the regime the ability to brutalize more and more Syrians. We found out this weekend, for example, that England was among those selling the ingredients for chemical weapons to the current regime in Damascus. At the same time, Saudi Arabia has been sending its second greatest export after oil, fighters. 
Equipped with modern weapons, neighboring countries opposed to the current Syrian government have been giving their blessings and their encouragement to their own people who want to go and intervene in a foreign war. Neither of these groups, the government or its armed adversaries, is fighting on behalf of the groups in Syria demanding basic rights. All the surrounding governments have their own agendas, and the Syrian regime has demonstrated its unwillingness to abide by basic international norms. How will a U.S. strike help this situation? If anything, American military involvement only reinforces those already engaged in combat, privileging an armed struggle as the only way to resolve the conflicts in which Syrians have been forced to survive. After millions displaced and more than 100,000 killed, the Obama administration lacks the imagination necessary to come up with any alternative to more casualties. Everyone recognizes that this sort of conflict can only be resolved for the long term through negotiations. Why not now? The conversations we hear today present us with a false dichotomy. Do we, quote, intervene or, quote, do nothing? Intervention for these pundits comes with a remarkably limited toolbox. We can intervene from the air or we can put boots on the ground. The only alternative to such intervention seems to be inaction. What a remarkable dichotomy. When we know that only political negotiations will work, why does intervention, why is one of the options not diplomacy? What happened to negotiation? Here's the historical context. U.S. military intervention from at least 1958 to the present has never resulted in the end of hostilities in the region, the establishment of a just peace, or an increase in security for the lives of the people. When the U.S. has intervened in the Middle East, we have managed to solidify intercommunal conflict, destroy infrastructure, and shatter lives. What the U.S. must do now is to begin intensive multilateral negotiations immediately with those who seek to benefit from the rivers of blood flowing in Syria. The government of Iran has made it clear that they are interested now with the new government in negotiation with the U.S. And their own experience as the victims of chemical warfare at the hands of Saddam Hussein's military has resulted in their condemnation of the Syrian regime. Our, quote, ally, Saudi Arabia, remains dependent on the U.S. for much of their hardware, including the cluster bombs we promised to send this last week, and perhaps they can find somewhere else to send their soldiers. At the same time, the international community must insist on bringing all Syrian combatants to the table to negotiate Syria's future. These talks must include all Syrians, but only Syrians. We would be furious about having foreign forces involved in determining our future here. We must give the Syrians the same respect. There has been a long-term civil society opposition movement that has paid dearly for its insistence on a stable and humane and democratic state. We need not introduce our new ideas about democracy. We simply have to recognize their ability to articulate their own needs. Too many red lines have been crossed, lines of blood coursing through all of Syria's major city as a result of ongoing carnage. As the Obama administration itself has pointed out, his proposed strikes will not definitively change the outcome. We need to tell our president that we must change the outcome, that Syrian children deserve a future, and that unless he expands his toolbox to work with the international community to enforce internationally recognized norms, his red lines will continue to be drawn with the blood of Syrians. Um, thank you, Sarah. Thanks to the organizers and as a second historian in the panel. Um, Please do something. This way? I think we keep that. OK. That's good. Uh, I think people cannot hear me anyway. So as a second historian, what um, I will say will be complementing what Sarah say from, um, from my own uh, studies of international history uh, in global governance and the regional politics. Um, I, somebody who lived in Syria for a short while and very good memories of Syria of 97 and 98, 
uh, as a poor student, um, where Syria was the cheapest country in our region because of socialism, um, I, I'm completely devastated by what's happening in that country. And we must do something. We must respond. I mean, that th these things should not be gone unnoticed or um, unpunished in many ways. Uh, but, uh, and, and in, in some ways, this is also showing this a failure of our own global system, UN system, global governance. Uh, and to repeat what Sarah says is that uh, America's intervention, though, the way that is framed by our politicians at this point, is going to look like uh, an arsonist trying to come back to the region as a fireman. And I wanted to, I picked this fire station analogy as the United Nations. And because America is part of the problem at this point, this, it contributed to the creation of this problem. And it cannot come back to the region as a neutral party imposing some sort of universal values. Um, I was going to use the Jedi metaphor, saying that we need a Jedi army, but um, that, that I thought the fire um, station would kind of explain what I, I mean better. And, what I suggest, though, however, is not an, uh, an American isolationism. And I, I you know, we, uh, because we are teaching uh, on this campus, we are uh, responsible in training the next generation. We don't want you to leave these meetings or our classroom with a certain sense of desperation about the post-Western, non-Eurocentric world where um, your values are not respected and you have nothing to do and you should just leave the world to the Russians and the Chinese. I hope they are doing panels like that, too. I don't mean that. I think this, um, what Sarah talks about, uh, uh, a political dialogue, a political solution, should also be extended to a dialogue about the values of international norms that, that shape international norms, uh, values that will reshape uh, the international institutions like the United Nations, which I think is already rotten in many ways. It, it's, it's the wrong institution to go with, and it, it, these events kind of reveals the weaknesses in the system. But uh, what, what the US does is that it doesn't allow the building of a new system, so it doesn't allow the building of a proper fire station, and we, all, we keep repeating the mistakes where, that we have been doing in the last uh, 30, 40 years. Uh, what I mean by that, in order to explain this, I want to go back to some sort of both the regional and uh, uh, global background of, of these things. Regionally, uh, what is happening in Syria is an extension, uh, is a continuation of a regional, what I was going to say, cold war, but it is becoming a real hot war. A cold war in which uh, uh, multiple sides involve the United States. Uh, on the one side, there is Iran. Um, which, is, uh, which, is, which is, is Shia network, uh, and it looks very identity-based, uh, uh, but it has its own values and norms. We should, not, we should not think that the US is the only side uh, that has its values. Together with Russia and China, these values include um, national sovereignty, resistance to imperialism, and uh, America's corrupt regimes, like the, the, some sort of a racial regime of Israel, and the uh, uh, monarchical regimes of Saudi Arabia and, and the Gulf regimes. Uh, and it has its own vision for, for the world. But we do know that this Iran axis, in many ways, involves both identity and certain set of values. Uh, next, in the regional Cold War, I could, uh, I could count Saudi Arabia. Um, it's a monarchical regime uh, with a couple of other allies, monarchical regimes. They are Sunni, but they are not in, you know, it's not inherited from a traditional Islamic past. It's basically the remnants of the British Empire who like to transfer power to other monarchies, right? That, that all of the monarchies in that region, which a lot of them are there, and you know, in my classes I show the picture of contemporary kingdoms and monarchies, and almost one third of them are Arab, and, and almost all of them are uh, sort of connected to the British legacy in the region. Well, what Saudi Arabia does with the oil wealth is, is to keep the status quo. And, and it, it's very afraid of the challenges, either democratization, liberalism. And it's also very uh, afraid of um, some sort of Islamic democracy, like Muslim Brotherhood, as well. And they, they keep pumping money, and they have money, like uh, with Qatar and other uh, regimes. And in this context, they're also afraid of Iran. So they are supporting the opposition that, that Sarah described. And we should. Now, note that America is in that camp in, in some ways. No matter what democratic ideals we espouse, we are a part of that seemingly conservative 
statu quo-oriented monarchical system in the Middle East. Uh, and there is some sort of a lonely Israel there. It's, it's almost an apartheid regime that is based on, at best, um, a repetition of settler colonialism uh, uh, in, in modern forms, still respecting some sort of norms uh, out there. There is a lonely Turkey, although it, it was recently um, uh, getting uh, some sort of a Muslim Brotherhood access on its side as, as a Muslim modernist group. And the US has complicated relationship with Israel supporting it, Saudi Arabia and Turkey, but also disagreeing at some point and, and, and targeting Iran. Uh, in that context, Russia and China come in as allies of Iran uh, in this region. So the region is, in a way, is very tense with, with, with highly polarized, uh, divided system. But what makes it difficult, in, in, in that sense, to deal with this regional crisis is the absence of an international mechanism to regulate things, an absence of, of any international leadership. Um, United Nations was established around World War II um, as not, not as an alternative to empire and, and great power politics, but as to continue that tradition. That's why we have this, this obsolete Security Council of five countries. Uh, one of them is Russia, which um, in, in a way is not a big power in other respects. Um, that has a veto power on every issue that, that, that requires intervention and security. And because the, the UN system is, is not functioning, the regional Cold Wars become uh, quite messy and quite bloody. And, and I think this is, we could say the other Cold War was also very messy and bloody, but um, there were still some values to work with, the US and the Soviet Union. And at the end, uh, what I will suggest is, is, in addition to this political dialogue, we also need to have an intellectual epistemological dialogue on the values that will shape the future. And we need, we need some sort of a two-way approach to restructure the, the international order so that we don't have crises like that in the world. But I will leave it to another historian at this point. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, is this, can you hear me? Is the microphone on? I can't tell. Yeah, we're good? OK. Um, I'd like to make three big points. Uh, one very general point about um, the nature of conflict, one about the ethics of this situation, and one about the pragmatic questions that the current crisis uh, raises. First, on the general point, um, we can say with confidence that we know how this conflict is going to turn out. It's going to end with some sort of political solution. It's going to end with some sort of political settlement. All wars point in the direction of political set settlements. All wars result in political settlements. What we don't know, and these are the big questions, are when that settlement will happen. And we don't know who will be a participant in making that settlement happen. Those are the big questions that are hanging over us. But the key thing here is that uh, this, this conflict has to end with some sort of political solution. Well, what's going to determine? What will weigh in the balance as that political solution is created? Uh, given the nature of the war up to this point, I think we can be pretty clear that force is going to determine what that, who will, at least who will participate in that political solution and what the possible parameters are for that political solution. Which um, I think emphasizes uh, a point of commonality that I share with Sarah, um, which is that, yes, this war has to end in negotiation because all wars end, to some extent, in negotiation. But... Um, who participates in that negotiation and how much effect they have in that negotiation will be determined by how much force I think they have on their side, which raises the question that if we want um, a, a democratic solution or we want a solution that respects the rights of democratic forces within Syria, the question is, um, well, what force is on their side? What force will give them leverage as part of that overall political settlement? Um, I don't know the answers to those questions, but I think they're questions that are important to ask right now. A word about the ethics of the situation. Um, over the last 10 years, and, and the political scientists in the room know this far better than me, um, the international community has adopted uh, the norm of the responsibility to protect. I don't think it's quite achieved the status of international law. I'll defer to the lawyers on that, but I think we can safely say that it's a norm. It's been endorsed by the UN General Assembly. It's been endorsed by the UN Security Council. And um, 
R2P lays out a number of criteria that have to be satisfied in order to consider an intervention uh, legitimate or, or just. There has to be a just cause. Uh, in other words, there has to be a threat to uh, a threat of serious and irreparable harm to human beings. I think we've satisfied the just cause requirement. There has to be the right intention. The interveners have to have the right goal in what they're trying to achieve, a humanitarian goal. Force has to be a last resort. Force has to be undertaken with a legitimate authority. This is, I, I think you could say, it, it may be in question, depending on how you look at the United Nations. Um, it looks unlikely that the Security Council will endorse this, but I think it's possible to make a case that NATO, or at least a coalition comprising part of NATO, could be considered a legitimate authority. The means have to be proportionate. That is to say, the force used has to be calibrated um, to the task at hand. And I think those first five criteria um, are pretty clear. They, they, they either have been satisfied or they can be satisfied. The sticking point, the, re the real sticking point here, ethically speaking, is on the sixth criteria, which is, um, is there a reasonable prospect that military action will do more harm, or will do more good than harm? Will military action do more good than harm? And the answer to that question has to be yes, according to the R2P doctrine, in order to consider action legitimate. And I think the answer to this question um, is at best ambiguous right now, especially considering the kind of action that the American government seems to be contemplating, uh, a very limited strike that seems like it won't have very much bearing on any political outcome of the current conflict. A word about pragmatics, uh, on the, the pragmatic questions here. The question that I would pose to the president or to anyone making the case in favor of intervention is, what is the political outcome you are trying to achieve? Based on the president's recent statements, it seems that he's not trying to achieve any particular political outcome at all, except to lay down a marker that the use of chemical weapons is illegitimate. Um, but uh, al-Assad has demonstrated that he doesn't care very much about international norms. Um, and it doesn't seem that signals from the international community limited as they seem to be, the limited as the ones in, pros in prospect seem to be, uh, will make any difference to the way he's thinking about um, his conduct in his country and the force that he's using against his own, his own uh, citizens. So in other words, if there is going to be an intervention, I would make the case that it has to be sufficient to really change the political outcome, the political situation on the ground, to produce a kind of political settlement that um, is, is possible and is ethically acceptable. The example of the Yugoslav Wars here in the 1990s, I think, may be useful. Um, and I'll, I think the two, the two key cases here are the, uh, the intervention in Bosnia in 1995 and the, the intervention in Kosovo in 1999 that have been cited repeatedly by commentators uh, on Syria um, in recent weeks. They, these two cases, Bosnia and Kosovo, are often cited as success stories. This is what um, a good intervention looks like. But it's important to remember, first of all, that in both cases, the political outcome sought by the intervention was very fuzzy when those interventions started. Uh, President Clinton, Prime Minister Blair were criticized relentlessly in 95 and, or, or excuse me, in um, Blair in 99, Clinton in 99, and Clinton in 95. They were criticized relentlessly for having an unclear strategy, for having unclear political objectives that they were trying to achieve, stumbling into bombing without knowing what they were wanting to do, what they wanted the ultimate settlement to look like. So this is to say that we should have some sort of, uh, we should have a bit of toleration for unclarity. We should have a little bit of toleration for fuzziness, at least at the start. Uh, these things can become clearer over time, but it's crucial um, that these things become clear very quickly. I think that the, the president, congressional leaders, and so on, other NATO leaders need to develop, if they haven't developed it yet, a very good idea of what they want that political settlement to look like. Um, the second point, though, that comes out of the Yugoslav case is that they were much easier cases to solve, it seems to me, than the case in Syria. Uh, the political solution that would solve the problem in Bosnia um, was partition, uh, was much easier to achieve, and disengagement along ethnic lines. Uh, the same thing was true in Kosovo, partition and, and disengagement al along ethnic lines. But it's less clear to me um, that either one of those scenarios is really feasible right now in Syria. So the example of the Yugoslav Wars, I think, um, they're, they're easy cases compared to the case that we have before us right now. 
Um, but they should also remind us that uh, they were messy at the time too, so we should not insist on perfection in dealing with the problem um, we have at hand. The bottom line, though, it seems to me, um, is that any outcome um, has to be negotiated and it has to be achieved through diplomacy. That seems to me um, uh, uh, almost, almost a self-evident point. Uh, but the question is, what will set the parameters of that negotiation? Who will be at the table? Um, and what sort of leverage will the participants have? That's what's really at stake when we're talking about intervention. Um, and that, I think, is the question um, I would encourage you to, to raise in discussions here today. Thank you. I guess we all have to play this game. Can, can I be heard? <laughs> How about now? Now? OK. Thank you. I have a number of points to make about the legality under international law, public international law, of various aspects of the Syrian war. First, this seems to be taken for granted, but I guess it's worth saying explicitly. It seems pretty clear that the use of chemical weapons, never mind the target for the chemical weapons, is illegal as a matter of international law. Uh, I am not sure about uh, Syria's adherence to treaties dealing with chemical weapons, but it really doesn't matter since this prohibition has attained, I think, the status of what is called customary international law. Second, it seems clear that under international law, deliberate attacks against civilians uh, are also illegal. Please note, I said deliberate attacks against civilians. One can go into various ramifications uh, of this, but since apparently we are dealing with deliberate attacks against civilians. I don't know that that's terribly important. The real problem comes in in analyzing uh, the international law regarding the use of force. The short way to describe this body of law is a mess. Uh, under the Charter of the United Nations, governments are forbidden to use force on their own against other governments except in self-defense. The United Nations, I should say, when it was organized, was intended essentially exclusively at preventing international war. That was its goal. Its structure reflects that intention. The corollary to the prohibition on the use of force by individual countries, except in self-defense, is the authority of the Security Council to use force essentially at its own discretion. Uh, the Charter permits the Security Council to act in the event of a threat to the peace, breach of the peace, or act of aggression, but it's up to the Security Council to decide what counts as a threat to the peace, breach of the peace, or act of aggression. Its discretion is effectively unlimited. Uh, now, on these facts, it seems as though the prospect of Security Council action is nil. Uh, China and Russia have both indicated that they will veto any sort of uh, resolution calling for military action. That then raises the question of whether there is some kind of an argument outside the UN Charter framework for any kind of forcible intervention. Uh, 
This is very problematic. As I said, the charter is quite unequivocal. Uh, states may not use force against other states except in self-defense, full stop. Now, a reference has been made to the responsibility to uh, protect principle. Uh, I have to admit that uh, I have long been skeptical about that principle. Uh, in any event, I feel comfortable saying that it is certainly not a rule of law. Understand what it means is that there is an obligation, in the, uh, if all else fails, to use force uh, to protect populations of other countries. I stress this is, as phrased, an obligation, not merely a right to act, but a duty to act. And that such a duty ha has been recognized uh, as a matter of law, I doubt. Uh, with respect to uh, the reference to the responsibility to protect by the General Assembly and Security Council, in both cases, I believe, uh, this was subordinated to approval of the Security Council. And since the Security Council can act whenever it likes anyway, it really doesn't add anything to the authority of the Security Council. The question of whether some form of humanitarian intervention would be permissible as opposed to obligatory uh, also seems to be uh, somewhat up in the air. Uh, the example most frequently given for a lawful humanitarian intervention is the NATO uh, bombing of Serbia uh, in connection uh, with threats to the populations of Kosovo. Uh, the difficulty with that precedent is that in the first place, a very large number of governments have never accepted that. Uh, and most international lawyers at the time the bombing took place uh, found themselves very much torn by it. The phrase that one keeps hearing in that connection is that this was illegal but legitimate. Now, I will leave it to all of you to parse it as you like, uh, I would say that one view of that is pretty much as good as any other. Uh, I would note also that one of the difficulties about citing that as a precedent is that it's a precedent for everybody. Russia, for example, uh, when it engaged in its war with Georgia, claimed that it was simply following the Kosovo precedent uh, protecting threats to the populations of secessionist areas of Georgia. Uh, sauce for the goose, sauce for the gander. Uh, I would also point out that what President Obama uh, is proposing, as I understand it, is not exactly a humanitarian intervention. A humanitarian intervention, as the term is normally used, is an intervention aimed at ending some sort of a threat uh, to a vulnerable population. Here, the objective, as I understand it, would be much narrower, simply attempting to deter future use of a particular illegal weapon. Uh, that is something that, as far as I know, has no precedent. Uh, and it is hard to reconcile it with the concept of a humanitarian intervention in one sense, since, of course, the, uh, what this would mean effectively is that we don't care so much uh, that you kill or who you kill. All we care about is how you kill. Uh, and dead is dead. So uh, I don't quite understand uh, 
how that would fit under the heading of humanitarian intervention. Uh, bottom line, uh, lawyers hate to be asked to pronounce definitely one way or the other, uh, but I would say the needle tends to swing in the direction of illegality uh, in this context, though I stress that this is one area where any very definite statement uh, is suspect. Uh, with respect to uh, suggestions that have been made earlier regarding altering the UN to somehow uh, regulate situations like this, uh, I would point out first that that would require a tremendous change in the structure of the UN, that in this context, if what is being regulated are uh, groups that are using force against one another, regulation means use of force. Talking about going to war. Finally, uh, it is worth pointing out that when we talk about enforcing international law, it's a little bit misleading uh, to speak as though all countries of the world are in exactly the same position. States that see themselves as likely targets of intervention are much less enthusiastic about humanitarian intervention uh, than some others. Furthermore, uh, if one asks how one goes about carrying out a humanitarian intervention, there really aren't many countries in the world capable of doing it. So figuring out what, in the real world, application of a particular rule would be uh, is, well, a little tricky. Thank you. time trying the microphone as we're shifting from historical and legal context to more political context. Can you hear me good? <laughs> All right. Uh, well, we're living in a very critical era, and I can say that uh, Middle East is definitely uh, out of joint right now. It is a very messy situation. And one of the reasons that uh, we can look at it is, uh, of course, the Arab Spring, but I can trace it back actually to the very uh, United States invasion to Iraq in 2003. That's actually the very momentum that I can find that the, the order, the hegemonic order in the very Middle East has changed. Technically, Iran was one of the uh, uh, few countries that took advantages of this U.S. invasion. The new Iraqi government was, of course, in favor in an alliance with Iran. And from now on, we see that uh, uh, various major powers in this region are fighting to restore or establish a new order, a new regional order, hegemonic order in, uh, in this region. Uh, it is sometimes ironic, especially after this Arab Spring, that we see that there has been a lot of confusion in alliances in, over the political agreements, over just a singular, particular even. Just to give you an example, S Saudi Arabia and the Qatari regime uh, are both supporting the Syrian uh, rebel, the Syrian opposition, while at the same time they're opposing actually what happened in Egypt. The Qataris were supporting the Morsi's regime, uh, Saudis were happy of the very coup d'etat that happened. You see the same with Turkey, for example. The Turkish prime minister condemned the coup d'etat in Egypt, while at the same time he's also supporting the Syrian opposition. Uh, you can see this confusion uh, even amongst the uh, scholars, even amongst the experts. Uh, you see that, for example, uh, uh, leftist revolutionaries, for example, are taking side with uh, the, the 
for example, Saudi Islamists, that yeah, military coup was legitimate in Egypt, while at the same time you see, for example, liberal siding with Ikhwan and Muslimin, that no, it wasn't, and it was absolutely an illegitimate coup d'etat. So, as we get through more to details, as they say, the devil is in detail. And the same goes with Syria. Uh, we just hear that, yes, there is a Bashar Assad government, and then there are these opposition. And yes, the Saudi Arabia and Qatari government and the Turkish uh, government are now supporting the opposition, while Iran is supporting, uh, uh, of course, uh, with the help of Russia and China, supporting the Bashar regime, the Assad regime. In reality, you see that even uh, the opposition are, uh, is very uh, uh, factious, and uh, they are fighting at the same time, competing with each other. Even the countries that are supporting are competing at the same time with each other. Saudis don't want Qataris to have the over, upper hand in, in Syria. Turks don't want, uh, Americans don't want, for example, the, those groups that are supported by Saudis or by Qataris who have the upper hand in Syria. So it is quite very, very messy situation. What can I tell for sure is if it started as a revolution in March 2011, and for the uh, first six or seven months it was technically a civil movement against the Assad regime, then it turned to a civil war. It is not even more a civil war. It is a proxy war that is spilling over the neighboring country at the same time and has gotten involved not the Turks, uh, Lebanese, Jordanese, and all other countries in the region. And, and this is one of the reasons that any country, and I would include even Iranian regime, is very hesitant to take the game, own it as its own, and interfere directly in what's going on in Syria. So speaking of Iran, let's talk a little bit more about the boogeyman of the Middle East, as it is called. As you know, uh, Syria has been for 30 years uh, uh, a very critical ally for Iran. And it's obviously, uh, uh, we hear this uh, mistake that this is an ideological alliance as well. In no way it could be. The Syrian regime was technically a secular regime. It was actually against any Islamic ideology. Just to give you one easy example, uh, Islamic hijab, there were some restrictions over Islamic hijab. And the very first phase of actually revolution demonstration in, in Syria, one of the demands of the popular uh, uh, movement was actually that uh, uh, let, let us have our own hijab, do not pose restriction on hijab. Uh, rather, the alliance between Iran and Syria has been tactical and strategic. Namely, during the 80s, I remember that the Iranian used to call that they had two friends during the time that they were engaged in a war with Iraq, Saddam Hussein. One was a crazy friend, namely Gaddafi of Libya, and the other was a beggar or a, a, a burglar who they used to call him this Assad, of course, half as Assad of that time in Syria. Why the crazy Gaddafi was technically, without having any clear ideology, used to support one day Iran against Iraq and the other day he would have changed. Syria, Iran had to send uh, the, the Assad regime every day uh, barrels of oil to buy the support against the Iraqis. Uh, even during uh, the 80s, during the civil Le uh, Lebanon civil war, we can see that Iran and Syria were not exactly on the same page. There has been a lot of rivalries, competition over, I mean, even between these two countries over who's going to rule and who's going to support which side in, in, in the Lebanon. So this is basically a fallacy calling that this alliance comes from some ideological regime. More than that, it is a fallacy that also call it that it comes from a certain religious, uh, I would say, uh, understanding of, uh, of this clash. Ten years ago, nobody would count it Alevis as Shias, nobody. Not the Shias of Lebanon, not even Sunnis who are living, who were, who are living in, in Syria wouldn't count them as Shia. But you see that as this, uh, uh, the events are unfolding and the clash goes on. And in Syria, yes, we have new definition of who belongs to which sectarian, religious sectarian clashes are reshaping and remaking every day. Uh, another fallacy that I want to mention and then close my this short remark uh, is that uh, basically the assumption is uh, the war is not over Syria. The war is actually 
against Iran. So if we can topple the Assad regime, <coughs> that means that also is Iran's uh, position in the region is going to be weakened, probably going to have a much, much better hand, higher hand in the negotiation table over Iran's nuclear program. In reality, yes, Iran's position is going to be weakened. Of course, Syria is a critical ally. Of course, Syria is very important. It, it provides Iran's access to the, the Shia, Hezbollah militia in Lebanon. Israel, uh, Syria is a very good front, important front for Iran uh, in its rivalries with Israel. But technically, that doesn't mean that uh, toppling of the Assad regime in Syria is going to be a complete total game changer in the region. No. I'll give you two examples. One is from the Iran side and one is because of what we can predict at least uh, both based on the history and both based on uh, the very demography of, of Syria of what's going to happen. Let's just start with the Syria one. So uh, Syria is part of a broader region that French used to call it Levant. Lebanon and Syria. And this particular region is very famous because of various ethno, uh, uh, at the same time, religious factions that have been living quite a long time with each other. And as if, you, if you look at the history, you see that all these various factions uh, have, at the same time, used the patronage system. Uh, they were proxies of some uh, outsider regime. You can go back from 3,000s ago when Assyrians were involved, and uh, Persians were involved, the Romans were involved, the Greeks were involved, of course, then the Ottoman Empire was involved, the French team, the, um, uh, the British and Americans. And uh, technically, even the very day that the Assad is toppled in, in Syria, you would see that exactly these very competing, uh, uh, opposing uh, various factions that were fighting against Assad is also going to start a competition, a very fierce one, who's going to take the power. And Iran is exactly well familiar with this situation. He knows actually what to do in this situation. He has done it, it has done it in, 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 in Lebanon, it has done it in Afghanistan, it has done it in Iraq. So the very worst case scenario is Iran would start a play of game again with various factions within the Syrian uh, opposing, opposition groups and uh, uh, would play with each of them, would of course cast his support. Of course you can argue that how come Iran can do that while well, it's actually all these opposition groups are against Iran and they see Iran as the most important uh, supporting factor of the Assad regime. I'll give you the, the Afghan uh, example. Uh, of course Iran was very happy when Taliban was toppled in Afghanistan, US invaded. Taliban was actually the most important, I would say, and the toughest enemy of Iran at that time. Iran was almost on the verge of war with the Taliban in Afghanistan, but the U.S. intervened. And then, as based on the very reports that we've heard from United States intelligence as well as military statements reports, we know that Iran supported uh, Taliban in, in, in certain times in its fight uh, against the United States troops. There. You can see the same thing in Iraq. Iran has technically sided with any group that was willing to work with Iran, uh, namely the Maliki, uh, uh, of course the government of Iraq, namely the, the Shia uh, militia forces, and namely even sometimes Salafis. So why not the same thing going to happen in Syria? The second is actually Iran is not Uh, as it was a year ago. We should also remember that the political situation in Iran has changed. In, in, in July, there was a presidential election, and uh, during which election, a moderate, uh, a moderate uh, a close to reformist president came to power. So Iran is right now happy if it has been supporting in the past two years uh, the Assad regime. is now actually happy to a little bit detach itself from the situation, and actually, over the, uh, this messy situation to someone else, namely the United States or any other country who's willing to own this situation by itself. Thank you. Okay, everybody hear me back in the back, okay? All right. Great. Well, I, I appreciate everything that my colleagues have said. They're making my job a little bit easier. 
What I'd like to, to do is to address the three main, or the th three strongest arguments or justifications or potential objectives that the United States could have um, for using missile strikes against uh, Assad's forces or, or um, the regime's assets in Syria. The first that we hear is that using missile strikes, responding could avoid damaging U.S. credibility since, the, since Obama um, drew this red line that we need to build a reputation for making good on threats. The audience here would be Iran, the Iranian government, North Korea, other rogue dictators. The second would be this idea that we could send a message that the use of weapons of mass destruction will not be tolerated, reinforce this, this international norm against using weapons of mass destruction. Potentially, the idea here would be to deter uh, future use by Assad or any other uh, rogue dictator or leader. And the third objective would potentially be to de degrade Assad's military capabilities to the point that the balance of power on the ground would be changed and Assad would be forced to the negotiating table. Let me, let me address each of these um, based on some of the empirical we, evidence that we have about whether the use of military force is likely to achieve these objectives. So this idea that, that using military force, in particular these, these missile strikes, would avoid damaging U.S. credibility, would, would build a reputation for making good on threats. The first point is that the use of force for reputation building has had disastrous results in the past. It has frequently led to, to further escalation of commitment because there's no natural stopping point. At any point, backing down reveals where your, the limits of your resolve. So missile, missile strikes are launched, there's a response, it doesn't have the, the effect that we want. At that point, we don't respond again. Then at that point, we've, we've revealed the limits of our, our, our willingness to intervene in this situation. It also seems that decision makers evaluate the credibility of threats based on the context, the very specific context of the current situation, rather than evaluating the credibility of threats based on a, a leader or a country's history in, in keeping its threats. Even if leaders were potentially to look to past behavior to try to judge whether a threat was credible or not based on whether a leader or a country had kept its threats in the past, it would be extremely complicated picture, right? Because this is just isn't a situation where you have an infraction and a punishment. But there's consequences of taking action and then there are responses to those consequences. So if striking Syria is more costly than anticipated, has unintended consequences, which inevitably it will have unintended consequences, so the escalation of involvement of other actors, terrorist strikes against U.S. interests, if the public, domestic public international, public reaction is poor or the international reaction is poor, or if it fails to deter Assad or other leaders, if any of these things happen after a U.S. missile strike, then it would be reasonable for a leader to conclude that the U.S. is not likely to repeat this mistake in the future. The idea that the United States could send a message that the use of weapons of mass destruction will not be tolerated with the use of military strikes at this point is also questionable. The US use of chemical weapons is, is undoubtedly horrific. It would be fantastic if a military strike on Syria would deter the future use of chemical weapons by Assad or any other leaders in the future. But 
the capability to do damage in this case does not necessarily translate into the capability to change calculations and to change future behavior. Isolated punitive strikes on Syria with little domestic or international support for any future action actually is not a very strong message to send. Assad and other dictators are likely to conclude that such a strike is a cost that they're willing to pay based on their perception of the advantages of using these weapons. In fact, it's likely that Assad considered that the United States might respond in this way and decided not that the United States wouldn't respond, but this type of response was a cost that he was willing to pay. Assad clearly has much more at stake here than the United States does. And this is exactly the type of situation in which the use of military force is very unlikely to change behavior. This final idea that we could degrade Assad's military capabilities and change the balance of power and force him to the negotiating table has a, has a number of problems. If we actually wanted to remove Assad from power, we could do that. Military force is very effective for this purpose. Major powers have an almost perfect track record of success in doing this. But we clearly don't want to do that. Uh, there are very few advocates for forcibly removing Assad from power. Because the situation after Assad falls is likely to be a situation of an ongoing brutal struggle for power. And the replacement for his regime is very likely to be worse for the United States as well as for the Syrian people. At, at least with providing weapons or training to rebel groups, the United States would have some control over who they are assisting. Striking directly against the Assad regime means that we are assisting all of the opponents of the Assad regime, even those that are most likely worse enemies of the United States than this regime. As my colleagues have mentioned, we're talking about multiple factions of opposition groups. Some of them might be willing to negotiate. Others may be less willing to negotiate. But shifting the balance of power in favor of the rebels doesn't necessarily make negoti a negotiated settlement more likely. If it makes a, even if it makes Assad more willing to come to the table, it may make other groups embolden other groups uh, it may have the effect of, of creating this moral hazard where rebel groups want to provoke an even more re extreme response from the regime in order to try to receive additional assistance from the United States or others in the international community. If you look at the empirical record of foreign interventions into civil wars since the end of World War II, it looks as if foreign intervention on behalf of opposition groups increases the likelihood that, that there will be a rebel military victory, but does not increase the likelihood of a negotiated settlement. Um, although I agree with you that, that in the end, in a manner of speaking, all wars end with some sort of a, a political settlement. The most consistent effect of foreign intervention appears to be to prolong civil wars, to broaden them, to include additional actors, and to increase the lethality of the wars. And just briefly um, to, to touch back on the Kosovo example, which has been brought up a, a number of times, um, I agree that this is, a, this is a poor analogy in the situation, but I also want to remind everyone that that situation, that bombing campaign lasted for 78 days. It was an intensive bombing campaign. Yes, Milosevic 
eventually agreed to negotiations, but it displaced potentially over 90% of the Albanian Kosovo residents, and the civilian casualty toll was estimated at between 10 and 20,000 in this situation. We did not look like we're anywhere near prepared for a 78-day intensive airstrike campaign in Syria. Um, and I'm not sure that anyone is enthusiastic for a death toll, a civilian death toll that high um, in, a, in a humanitarian intervention. I'm not good with electronics. Um, first off, thanks to Dr. Lee for allowing us as fellows to participate in this forum. Uh, as a War College fellow, we're often looking for opportunities to interact with students. This is a little bit more than we anticipated, but it, it's really awesome to be part of this. Um, I'm going to give a few brief comments, and, and, and ultimately you'll, what you'll find is that, that I'm, I'm very similar uh, to my colleague to my right, and, uh, and I'll end sort of with a question. Uh, and I'll start with where she ended. Uh, I was actually in Bosnia in 97 and 98. I also was a battery commander that helped plan uh, the ground invasion that wasn't for Kosovo uh, and, and would have supported that. And uh, I've been traveling the Middle East since 2000, and so I have uh, a little bit of contextual background, uh, historical, legal, and otherwise, in, in some of the things that we've done and haven't, et cetera. Uh, and so I'm, I'm always willing to take uh, some of the interesting questions that comes out of that as a result. But uh, to, to the matter at hand, after 23 years of service, it, it's rare for me the, to answer the should we question. You know, I'm, I'm normally the guy that they come to with the what are the options, what, what can we do? And we obviously come back and, and ultimately inform through the president uh, what the possibilities are. And, and as we've seen, uh, as we were coming in here today, both Secretary Kerry, Secretary Hagel, and General Dempsey were actually uh, testifying to the Senate Armed Services Committee. And so uh, they may have changed some of the things that we knew coming in before this. Uh, but, but coming into it, we, we had a few stated goals, which, which I want to review, which were to deter disrupt, degrade, and prevent the use of chemical weapons. Now that's a big order, and in military speak, that means there's a whole lot of other stuff to achieve each of those uh, words, okay? Uh, beyond that, the other stated goal was to reestablish respect for a red line. Now, <clears throat> the real question comes down to is can a strike do that, or can a series of strikes do that, limited or otherwise? And it may surprise you that a military officer is hesitant, uh, but I have to tell you I have concerns, much like we're just voiced, as to whether or not our action would achieve the stated goals. Now, as an officer, I have to tell you that if they choose and they say, you know, military action is part of what we believe will achieve the goals, then I'm all in, period. That's what we do. But in the process of that, you as the civilians who run our government and subsequently the military, you have to ask yourself, and more importantly your leaders and, and, and your elected leaders, is, is this really accomplishing what you think it is? And, and much like what was stated very early on in the panel, whether we strike or not, it will ultimately come down to a, a settled you know, agreement. And whether or not you need us collectively the military to do that becomes a very interesting question and history is often borne out that we we're, we're good at what we do but what we do may not give you what you thought it was really gonna so you need to learn uh, as aspiring leaders uh, and especially I understand we have a, a bunch of high school students in here so whatever we choose to do you guys are going to end up fixing it <laughs> uh, you know is uh, is ultimately understand that the use of force is not a joke. 
It will achieve what you ask, it will do what you ask it to do. If you want me to hit targets, we'll hit a target and it will create an effect. But ultimately, will it create the effect that you want long term? And so while, you know, it may surprise you that a military guy would say, you know, maybe, maybe don't use force or, or whatever, I would just tell you, use force when you need it, understand what you're asking for, and make it count. Because otherwise, you're creating problems that may take generations to fix, which I think has borne out by other panel members. So uh, uh, I'll cut it short there and uh, pass over to my colleague, Rich, but look forward to your questions. Hey, good evening. And again, as Bob said, we're uh, d very delighted to be here this evening uh, with you. And uh, what I'll get into is more of the response, if the, if the military response is required in this action. Uh, first and foremost, after uh, spending the last five and a half years of my life in the Middle East, uh, up and down in all the conflicts, uh, no one wants to see the democracy and negotiations work more than our soldiers, sailors, sailors, airmen, and marines. The ones who will do our nation's bidding for us. And so right off the bat, that's the number one thing that we want to see. Uh, but in the event the administration sees fit to, for us to strike Syria, as Bob said, uh, we're all in. And, uh, and that's what the U.S. military does. Uh, we don't ask why, we just ask where. And there we go. And so for that, the U.S. military response and as Bob said, you know, as of this morning, we didn't get to see what Secretary Hagel, whether he changed his, uh, his wording or not, but as of this morning was to deter, disrupt, prevent, and degrade the regime's ability to use chemical weapons. Uh, but the administration was clear that they're not looking for a regime change or removing Assad from power. And that's really a hard thing there, which goes back to my colleague's comments. How do you degrade a chemical weapons uh, implementation, but you're not going to degrade his, his power base in the region? And so that's the struggle there for us in the military. Uh, th this, uh, this strike will be a short duration strike uh, for the Secretary of Defense to eliminate military targets by means of limited precision strikes. Uh, with our target base being the Syrian military headquarters, which brings another, uh, unlike uh, our, our military facilities, uh, we don't put a lot of our infrastructure in downtown cities. Uh, in the Middle East, you'll find there in rooted in that's in the cities themselves. Uh, in Syria, Damascus itself, to hit that uh, Syrian headquarters would take out a lot of innocent civilians. And so that would become a problem. Uh, the key weapon and storage sites, and again, another target uh, that becomes a hard target for us. This isn't like uh, uh, nuclear, biological, or chemical weapons. Uh, I mean, nuclear, biological, which are big targets and easy to find. Chemical weapons are small, uh, could be mortar, uh, artillery, uh, or aircraft uh, produced. And so to find all of those in a country the size of Syria and trying to eliminate even a small amount of that stockpile would be increasingly hard. But that's one of our target sets. And then the second one would be command and control. Uh, the means that, the, that we're looking at as of today, we have six warships sitting in the uh, eastern Mediterranean Sea, all within range of Syria, and all, all can cover the entire country of Syria. Five of those being destroyers with cruise missiles, in the event the U.S. decides to use uh, air power or any of our aircrafts, uh, multiple air bases in the Med region to include two carrier battle groups, one in the Persian Gulf and one sitting off the coast of Yemen as of this morning in the Indian Ocean, could all strike these targets uh, on call. And pending any questions, that's all I have. 